All right, so Proverbs chapter number two, as I mentioned, is a little bit of a shorter chapter. Uh, very few concepts overall brought up, especially when you compare it to the rest. As we get into this, you're going to notice, like, you start getting into the later chapters of Proverbs, there's like, all, it almost seems like a different concept every verse or every other verse. So there's going to be a lot that we're going to be getting into. But tonight, it's a very simple message. It's, it's almost a continuation just from last week. And one thing I want to point out as we're getting into the book of Proverbs, and just to keep this in mind week after week, try to remember and, and think about the things that are brought up repetitively. If there's repetition in the Bible, God thinks it's important for us. The more, thing, more times you see something, the more we should be paying attention. Now, as we just read this entire chapter, the one thing that sticks out again is the wisdom, is the knowledge, right? That was kind of the main theme of chapter number one. We saw that a lot. That's the whole point of the Proverbs and, and is for us to gain wisdom and understanding. And we're going to see how we can do that and, and the ways that we can achieve getting smarter, getting more wisdom, getting more knowledge as we read through this book. And it kind of gets laid on layer after layer after layer, getting more in depth. We still have more of a basic overview and more of the, the virtues and the value of being wise we see here covered in chapter number two and what it's going to help prevent. So let's dig into the chapter. Let's look at, um, well, before, before we even do that, well, let's look at verse number one. It's fine. Verse number one. The Bible reads, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. The first thing we see here, if, he's a, if you're going to receive my words, if you're going to listen to me, if you're going to receive what I'm saying and hide my commandments with you, what does it mean to hide my commandments with you? Does that mean have a little, a little cheat sheet? And like hide them in your pocket? No. When you see the, the Bible talk about hiding things or like hiding things in your heart, you'll see that in the book of Psalms and much in the book of Proverbs. You'll see, hide my commandments with thee. It basically is talking about memorization. It's talking about knowing them and knowing it so well that it's with you. Yeah. When, when you hide my commandments with thee, you're, you're keeping it. No one could take that away from you. It's, it's hidden within your heart. It's, it, you've received it to the point to where you know it. Now, we stress, every week after week, you know, I, I go over our announcements and we do a Bible memory passage, right? I do believe that Bible memory is important. That's why we do it. Now, of course, it's not required. We don't have requirements like that in church. And I'm not going to look down on anybody that doesn't memorize Scripture. <laughs> I just want you to know here, though, it's, it's for your own benefit. And I, and I do, you know, I, I may... Um, really push for it, but I don't want, first of all, I don't want anyone to feel bad for like not memorizing because that's not the point. I'm not trying to make you feel like you are just a terrible Christian if you don't memorize scripture. But the reason why I bring it up so much is because I do think it's extremely helpful and it will get you wise and it's only going to be very, very good for you to memorize it. So it, it is something I place a high value on. I think it's very important for us to do. But again, you know, it's not, it's not one of those things where it's just like, it's a requirement that you have to do this. And we don't have any requirements. You, you know what? If you don't want to go soul winning, don't go soul winning. If you don't want to come to church, don't come to church. If you don't want to read your Bible, don't read your Bible. If you want to memorize the Bible, don't, you know. That's your prerogative. I hope you keep coming back. You know, I love, I love having the people here that are here. But um, it is one of those things I believe is important. And we're looking at a book here of wisdom. And you have to ask yourself, how much do you want to be wise? I mean, just think, if you could just wake up tomorrow and just be, just have immense wisdom, have the wisdom of, of Solomon, right? Solomon prayed to God and asked for wisdom. If you just be like, God just answered, just be like, boom. And just have this awesome wisdom. I mean, who wouldn't want to just be really wise? Who wouldn't want to be the person that everyone turns to just ask for counsel because every time that you give advice to someone, it's just great advice. And the advice that you're given is solid and, and every single time and you're able to make the right decisions. You know what the right thing is to do. You don't even have to question it. You're so grounded and found. You have so much wisdom that things that are ju just become obvious to you. Of course. Of course that's a bad decision. Of course that's a mistake. We oftentimes can, can struggle within ourselves thinking, man, what's the right thing? What should I be doing here? And ultimately, I think it boils down to either a lack of wisdom 
or just maybe a desire to to want to do something that you already might know that you're not you know like kind of a fleshly desire to just not want to do something you could have the wisdom and you say like you know what's wrong but you might struggle a little bit because like well i really want to do this i know it's wrong but i shouldn't do it but the other aspect is you know if you if you don't have that flesh desire it's just i just want to do what's right if you don't have the wisdom you won't always know what's right to do for example, I'll give, you, I'll give you, you know, it might seem like a silly example. It seems like a silly example to me, but in zeal, and, and a lot of times people are very zealous to serve God and to, and to get people saved and to do things right and to, and to just really to reach people. I, I've seen in a lot of liberal churches and evangelical churches that will say like, oh yeah, you know, if you just need to go in, you know, go ahead, go to the bar, have a few drinks with your buddy and, you know, establish that relationship with them in order to preach him the gospel. To me, that's foolishness. Now, obviously you have a good intent. You want to do what's right, but you're going about it completely the wrong way. It's just like in Romans 10, the Bible says, you know, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. You could be zealous for serving God, but just not have the wisdom, not have the knowledge. And you're going to bring a lot more problems upon yourself without having that wisdom. So, I know, for, I for one would love to just have all the wisdom of the world, but you have to ask yourself, how much are you willing to do for it? How bad do you want it? Because it doesn't just come with the snap of a finger. You can't just put your Bible on your bed at night and get like this osmosis of, of wisdom just coming into your brain and like, I want the easy way to get the wisdom. You know, I don't have to do any work for it. No, if you're going to be wise, if, you, if you're going to actually receive and, and get to the point to where you have a lot of wisdom, it's going to take time, but it's also going to take a lot of effort. Don't balk at the time and just throw your hands up in the air and say, well, I forget it. Unless you don't really care about having wisdom. I don't know about you, but I wish I had a lot more wisdom earlier on in my life because I made all kinds of bad mistakes, but I didn't have to make any of them. The wisdom was here and available. It's ready for us, but we need to be willing to push ourselves. And, and sometimes, even if you think it's boring, even if you say, you know what, I've heard this before, to keep at it and to go with it. Now, one of the ways that we can make sure that we receive the wisdom is by keeping, hiding the commandments with us. When you know that the Bible says this is wrong, this is a sin, because it's hidden in your heart, you don't need to say, well, wait a minute, what does the Bible say about, you know, drinking alcohol? And I, well, let's just see, where does it talk about it? Let's see, and try to find out, like all the verses, kind of study it out. It's good to study things out, but the wisdom is you already know. You're already established. Oh, yeah, I know what Habakkuk 2 says. I know what it says in Genesis. I know what it says in all these various places about drinking alcohol. I know what Proverbs 23 says. I know what all these verses say. It's hidden in my heart. I already know it. That's where you gain that wisdom. And one of the reasons why we do the Bible memory verses is because we're trying to hide God's commandments. We're trying to hide God's word in our heart so that it's always with us everywhere we go. And it'll help you when the moment arises and you don't have the time to study something out and you just got to make a decision to be able to base that decision on wisdom. And when it's in your heart, see, the, the, one, of the, one of the functions of the Holy Ghost that resides within us is to bring to remembrance the things that God has said. And He can help bring up the, the, the Bible that we have already memorized, that we've already hidden in our heart. He can just, oh, here you go. Hey, here's this. This is here. This is here. This is here. When it's already inside of you, as opposed to if you don't, if you're not hiding it in you, he's only going to have a limited, you know, like, well, here's John 3.16. You know, like, that's all you know, then that's all he's going to be able to, to, to give to you, right? If, you, if, you don't, if you're not putting God's word in your heart and hiding the commandments with you. So, again, I just wanted to make that point because it's not, it's not designed, you know, I ask for a show of hands because I just want people to get excited and I also need to know how many prizes I should be planning on getting. But um, <laughs> for the Bible memory passage, I do think it's important, and I think everyone should try to make an effort to do it. But, you know, if you don't, that's, you know, that's your prerogative. But I do, do, we see right here, talking about receiving the words and receiving wisdom, and we'll see as we go through the chapter in context now, because I know we stopped at verse number one, how this can help you to just be more wise and just have more understanding. Look at verse number two. So that thou incline thine ear 
unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. So when you're gonna, if you're going to get wisdom, you say you need to incline your ear unto wisdom. You need to get ready to hear. You need to make sure that you're set, willing to hear the Bible. You know, it's not going to happen by chance. None of this stuff happens by chance. You need to be seeking it out and inclining your ear, ear unto to listening. And, you know, one of the great ways of doing that is by coming to church. So I'm going to incline my ears. I'm going to come and listen to God's word be preached to receive that wisdom. And there's no better time than Wednesday nights here because we're going through the whole book of Proverbs, right? And apply thine heart to understand it. Your, your heart needs to be softened up and ready to go. You can't have a proud heart, lift it up, or a hard heart. You know, if you're going to gain wisdom, you have to be humble. Your heart has to be soft. You have to be ready to just receive and say, I know I'm not perfect, God, and that's why I'm here. I want to learn more. I want to get more wisdom and be smarter and do the right things and have the heart that's ready. Because when you already think you're a know-it-all and you think you know everything, you're not going to gain wisdom. You're not going to learn anything. You, if, who's going to teach you if, you're, if you already know it all? Nobody. I've run into so many people like that out soloing. You run into a lot. I mean, it's just kind of a common thing where... I remember one instance I talked to a guy and he's like, yeah, I've been to all these churches and, and all the pastors are idiots. They're all stupid. You know, like I just know, so I can't go to a church where I just know so much more than the pastor. And it's like right off the bat, I'm just like, yeah, there's not any pride there with this guy, right? He just knows so much more. And it's like, this is the type of guy that'll spend maybe an hour or two maybe talking to someone just, just oh, you're just an idiot. You have no idea what they know. And just because you disagree with someone doesn't make someone an idiot. It doesn't make you just ignorant and, oh, I just know so much more than this person because you disagree about something, right? I mean, I don't automatically think that people I disagree with, even if I vehemently think that they're wrong, I don't just always think that they're idiots because they're not. They're not necessarily an idiot. But our hearts need to be ruined. We're approaching God's word we might as well be idiots because we're, we're dealing with God's truth here. I mean, this is, this is all the wisdom that we could you know, ever hope for found in God's word. We need to approach this and just say, God, teach me. You know, my ear is ready to hear. My heart is ready to receive. I'm open. Show me what I need to do. And this is something we should consistently be able to approach the Bible with. The, um, you know, the old adage, it's, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. The, the older we get, even as Christians, and, and you kind of build your doctrines and what you believe, there are certain things like salvation by grace through faith. There are certain things that are foundational that I don't think you have to question. I mean, honestly, like, like you should get to the point where you're just like, you're solid on this, and there's no question about it. But you should always remain a little bit open for a lot of, you know, a lot of other doctrines and things that you might feel kind of settled on, but be willing to let God's Word teach you. Now, I know there's a lot of false, you know, false prophets and false teachers out there. I'm not just saying being open to them, but even being open to God's Word. So if someone challenges what you believe, you don't even necessarily have to just go out to prove why you're right. Just prove what God's Word says. Say, okay, if there's a challenge here, let's just see what the Bible says. Does, is it adding up? If someone's going to present a different argument to you, just, let's just insert that, that, that belief, that doctrine. Uh, and let's just write it down and let's see, does the Bible support this or not? You know, this is the type of attitude we ought to have when approaching God's Word and just being ready to get wisdom. But it's not easy to do that, right? It, it takes work. It takes effort to be able to analyze everything and to try every spirit, whether it be of God. Now, um, verse number three, let's keep going here. It says, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding. This is really emphasizing how bad you want to get knowledge. He's saying if you cry after it, it doesn't mean weeping, crying. You know, it's crying out with your voice. Cry it out. Knowledge, please, I want to have some wisdom. You're excited. You want it. You're screaming after it. And you lift up your voice and say, I just want to understand. God, please help me to understand. It's that, that emotion involved of, of how bad you really want to have that understanding. He's saying, look, if you'll receive my words, if 
you hide my commandments in your heart, if you get your heart ready, you get your ears ready, and you are just crying after knowledge. It's a lot of effort. I mean, that's, that's a strong desire to want to learn. That's not just, eh, yeah, well, it would be nice to know that. Kind of like sometimes I think it would be nice to know another language. I could learn another language, but I'd have to be really zealous after going after it and, and make it a, a point to learn it. Hopefully you don't have that attitude towards the Bible and having wisdom and you know, godly wisdom. Yeah, it would be nice to have that. No, in order to get it, you need, to, you need to, to cry after You need to shout after it and, and want it that bad. Look at verse number four. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures. Now, think, ask yourself this question. How much effort would you put forth if someone that was a reliable source to you, someone, you know, a good friend or someone gave you a treasure map? Now, I know it's kind of silly, but go with the example with me. They said, here is a map that I found. It's an old map. And this is a, a trusted source, right? This is reliable. And, you know, I found this in this old house somewhere and, it's, and they've got everything outlined to, to digging this up and there's probably going to be all this treasure and there's a whole inventory, all the stuff listed there of how much effort you would put forth if you thought that's really attainable. If you said, wow, you know, this, is, this sounds pretty good. I think I can do this. How much effort would you put forth into that? Would you take time off of work? Probably. Would you, you know, if you had to maybe even buy a piece of property in order to get on that land and get it, would you do it? You probably would. I mean, depending on what you're looking for, right? If you have this valuable treasure and he's saying that's how people seek after money and after silver and all, all this value, valuable, right? Hidden treasures. How much would you go after that stuff? He's saying that's how you need to seek after wisdom. See, the money is important. We know that the money is not important. But if you could say to yourself, you know what? Yeah, I would put forth all kinds of effort. If I go, you know, go gold panning and go, you know, go find this buried treasure or whatever and just put forth all this energy and effort to go and do that, you're going to be wasting your time because that's an energy that you need to be investing in getting wisdom and getting knowledge. And that's what he's saying. This is, the, this is the, the type of mentality, right? The way that people seek after silver and seek after treasures. That's the way that you ought to be seeking after um, God's word and getting wisdom. Verse number five, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Now, after all of these things, it's a lot of work. He's saying when you get to this point, you're crying after, your heart's ready, your ear's ready, you're, excuse me, hiding the commandments in your heart and you're seeking after wisdom as silver and precious treasures. When you get to that point, he says, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Now, if you remember from chapter 1, the Bible said that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. He's saying just fearing God, that's the beginning. Now we're at the point here in chapter 2, he says you're going to understand the fear of the Lord. See, the first step is just fear God, right? Fear God and keep His commandments. That's what you just need to do that. But as you go and as you seek out and search out wisdom, God will give it to you and then you'll understand why you need to fear God and you understand and gain that understanding of the fear of the Lord and he'll add to you uh, giving you the knowledge of God and you'll find the knowledge of God and you'll start to understand things more. See, the beginning part just begins with the faith. Just, I just believe the Bible's true so I'm going to do what God says. And then as you continue and as you seek out, God will give to you. He'll open up your understanding. He'll give you wisdom. And, but you have to have this type of an attitude in order to receive that. Let's keep reading here. Verse number six. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth. Uh, excuse me. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. God's the one, ultimately, that gives wisdom. And that's why we pray to God for wisdom. But we need to also seek it out. You can't just be uh, expecting God to give you a bunch of wisdom if you're not doing anything for it. Just as much as you can expect God to take care of you. If you're a, if you're a fully able man and capable of working, you can't just be like, well, God's just going to take care of me. I'm just going to sit down on the couch and, and just have full faith in God that He's just going to take care of me and He's going to send somebody to bring me food while I'm just sitting here on the couch and I don't even have to lift a finger and I'm just going to be fed and God's just going to take care of me. That's how much faith I have. That is stupidity. 
It really is. That is just a complete lack of wisdom if you think like that. God always expects us to do work and to, and to work and to do things that we need to do. We need to strive for wisdom. We need to strive for all these things that are important. Now, God will step in and He'll reach us you know, when we're, when we're putting forth the effort we need to do, when I'm working as hard as I can, when I'm putting forth my effort, if I'm lacking anywhere, God will step, step in and supply my need. Absolutely. But He has to meet me at that point. He's not going to just say like, yeah, well, whatever, you're, you're a lazy bum, but I'm just going to continue to just take care of you. And it's the same thing with wisdom. He's not going to open up your wisdom and understanding and grant you that extra knowledge if you're not doing anything with it and if you're not seeking it out. Now, there's many people today that put a high value on education and wisdom. Unfortunately, most people are seeking it are seeking it out in all the wrong places. A lot of people, you run into people that just, you know, man, I just really want to know things. They have a desire for knowledge. And oftentimes, these are the very people that profess themselves to be wise, and they're the biggest fools of all. You know, I run into people. I know when I was going to university, there's people that seem to be just lifelong students. Like they're just getting all these degrees and they're taking all these classes because they just want to know. Now, I have no problem with people wanting to learn knowledge. I think it's a great thing. But true wisdom starts with the fear of the Lord. And most of the people that get involved in those institutions, they, get, they don't care about God at all. It's really just a pride thing of them just knowing more and more and more and just being smart, you know, smarter than everybody else. But the funny thing about that, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Keep a finger in Proverbs 2. Of course, we're coming back to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. That knowledge is worthless. Or worth very little. Some of that knowledge might do you some good in this world. But... It's nothing compared to the knowledge and wisdom that God's knowledge and wisdom would give you anyways. God's wisdom will, will supersede their knowledge any day of the week. God's wisdom will teach you how to be a hard worker. God's wisdom will teach you how to not get involved in traps and snares and, and, and sins that's going to destroy your life. I mean, I don't care how many degrees you have uh, or doctorates or whatever in the medical field, in engineering, in mathematics, in science, in any field. I don't care in liberal arts, whatever. Add them all up. You could have all those in the world. You're a fool if you don't believe in God and if you don't understand the fear of the Lord. Right. You're a fool. That's the bottom line. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 18. The Bible says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, like those people that just are continually out to, to learn and learn and learn what this world has to offer, if any of you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. In order to have true wisdom, in order to truly be smart and have knowledge, you've got to become a fool. Verse number 19. Now, become a fool in the sense that he's, people will... will consider, you know, Christian, Christians foolish. That's the sense that, you know, in, in the context, that's what he's talking about. People who, who preach Jesus Christ and who look at the Bible, the world considers us to be fools. So he's saying, look, if any of you among you seem to be wise in this world, because the people that esteem the college degrees, he's saying, you need to become a fool in order to become truly wise. Let's keep reading here, verse number 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. He's saying, you know what? All the wisdom of this world is foolishness. God just thinking, you are so stupid. These people that think they're so smart and, you know, they've got these, uh, this big, what is that, what is that stupid, the, the collider machine? The, what's that thing called? The accelerator. The accelerator, yeah, the, the, the particle accelerator thing, right? I mean, these people, they think they're so smart and they're doing all, you know, and God's just like, you're so foolish. Right. And people lift up these scientists and, you know, and, and just extol how great mankind is and how smart we are today and be so proud and lifted up and all these great things we can do. And God's like, you're dumb. <laughs> like, really? You're, so you, you, have, you, you lack so much intelligence. You lack so much wisdom in God's view. And 
the one who has all the wisdom is, is telling us. I mean, it's a good place to start. If you want to know wisdom, why don't you go to the source of wisdom, the source of knowledge, the creator who made everything, who has all the knowledge in the world and then some. Let's see what he has to say about us receiving knowledge. He says, you know what? You need to become a fool and, and you know, in the world's eyes, the worldly view of foolishness versus wisdom, and then you can actually become wise. And we have his instructions here. Flip back, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 2. We don't need to get caught up with the foolishness of this world and the wisdom of this world. Don't feel like it's just going to make you so much smarter of a person by going to all these different colleges and universities and getting degrees. If you truly desire wisdom and to be smart, get your face in this book. Now, if you want to learn about something in a college class, I'm, I don't think it's necessarily inherently wrong to just learn about other things. It's, it's, you know, it's fine. But the things that are truly going to matter in your life, the things that's truly going to make the most impact in your life and the things that you really want to be wise about, you're going to find in this book. Let's take something that's not sinful whatsoever. I'll think about like my degree, right, in my computer science. Now, unfortunately, there were some sinful classes that I took that were just, you know, total evolution, all this other stuff, because you have to fix, you know, get these general education requirements and, and all the liberal propaganda. They put you through all the propaganda in order to get your degree from these universities. And I wouldn't recommend anyone going to those. Now, you want to go to tech school or whatever, that's fine. But, like, let's just focus on the aspect of the, the technical stuff that I learned. Right? How computers work and how you could communicate with a computer and the languages and those types of things. There's nothing inherently sinful with that. You're just learning how a machine operates and how you can use a tool or a machine to do something and, and, and to, to do work for you. Right? I mean, it's ultimately a real simple piece of what you're doing. I could spend all kinds of time studying and researching and learning and gain all of this wisdom in that area, right? And completely destroy my life through drugs, through alcohol, through adultery, through you name it, right? And what is that knowledge going to do me? Nothing. It just ruin me, destroy me, or I could just get so proud in my knowledge that I think I'm so smart, I don't need God, right? I don't want anything to do with God and just live an atheist life and die and go to hell. Or I could get the, the fear of God and maybe never understand whatsoever how a computer operates, but I could learn the wisdom. And we'll see this as we go through this, how God teaches you to be a hard worker, right? If any man shall not work, neither should he eat. And I learn these principles. And I learn how to work with my own hands. And I learn how to avoid the adulterous woman. Learn how to avoid the strange woman that we'll get to in the, at the end of this chapter and the wicked man. And stay away from those people. And just learn to do what's right and learn to live a righteous, godly lifestyle. And, to, and if I can do that, my life will be full of joy and happiness and sense of accomplishment and completion. And I will know that I am doing the right things and I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And there is no better satisfaction. And ultimately, in this lifetime, if you're gaining, you know, if you're seeking for your best life now in this world, that's the way you're going to get it. Your best life is going to be through obedience to God's commands. You don't need the world's wisdom to achieve happiness. Now, what I can achieve by learning the world's wisdom, maybe is a lot of money, right? Getting these, this, this real high skill set, I can, might be able to earn a lot of money for myself. But they that will be rich pierce themselves and will drown themselves in sorrows. I mean, that's what, what the Bible says about... Um, you know, they, they that will be which if you desire to be rich. The Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Now let's keep reading here in Proverbs chapter 2. He's playing with the no, 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 no. Proverbs chapter 2. Are you in Proverbs chapter 2? Look at verse number 7. Verse number 7. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Now we're getting into him laying up more, laying up sound wisdom for the righteous, for people who have already listened 
and started on the right path, right? They're listening to God and they're gaining instruction. He's going to add more wisdom. So the more you're listening to God, the more he's going to tell you, right? If you're stuck at step number one right. and you're not implementing it, you're not doing anything with it, you're not, you're not, you're not actually following, why is he going to tell you any more, right? It's like with my children, if I just tell them, you know, you need to clean your room or whatever, right? It's an instruction. I'm not going to show them anything more after that. I'm going to be stuck on, did you clean your room? Did you clean your room? Did you clean your room? Did you clean your room, right? Just, just one thing. Now, I'm not saying that cleaning the room is, is necessarily wisdom, but I'm going to be stuck on that one thing until they get it done. So as we start obeying God, he'll, he'll teach us more things. Now, cleaning a room can be, a, you know, it can give them wisdom, um, because it'll teach them for the rest of their life how to maintain order and to be able to do things more efficiently so they have more time to do other things, right? I mean, you could kind of extrapolate the, the wisdom out of that, but with God, he lays up wisdom for the righteous. When you're doing what's right and you're following what he's telling you to do, he's going to say, well, I'll tell you even more. I'll, I'll give you even more wisdom. And it says here he's a buckler to them that walk up right now. A buckler is just like a shield, is all it is. So he's going to help defend you. It says to them that walk uprightly, the people who are doing what's right. So start doing what's right and God will reveal more unto you. Let's read verses 8 and 9. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of the saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. Now don't you want God looking out for you and guiding you? Of course I do. I mean, I want God to, to direct every single one of my paths. And it says here, he keeps the paths of judgment and he preserves the way of his saints. So God will light up your path for you. He says, this is the way that you need to follow. When you're seeking after wisdom, when you're doing what's right, God will be that shield to defend you and to help to, to fight off people attacking you. And it says, then you'll also understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Equity is what's right. Things that are that are that are. Uh, equal, what's, what's right, what's balanced, what's the way that we should be, uh, be living. And, yea, every good path. You'll know the right way to take. It says every good path. So you have, oftentimes in this life, there's different paths you could take. You're always faced with, with these different opportunities and different options and different things. Where you could do, I could go this way or this way. This will give you every right path. God says, I'll lead you in every right path. But you have to be doing what God's telling you to do. It's, very, it's a very simple plan. Now, like this, what's, what's, amaz what's amazing about this whole concept with wisdom and getting smarter is that it's very simple, right? It's not, it's not, it's not rocket science. It's not these things that are just extremely difficult concepts. It's actually really simple and really basic and really rudimentary and really fundamental but we need to hear them over and over again. I mean, we've already seen a bunch of repetition. We're only nine verses in. And you'll see that as we continue to go, but we need to get it through our heads that it's the basic, simple things that we need to make sure that we adhere to to, to keep us on the right path. But the, I mean, it's not always the easy way, but it's, it's simple. And if you want God um, to help guide you and, and, and show you which path today, be, be listening, be ready, be receptive to hearing what is the right way. Verse number 10, when wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. So when you get to the point that you actually enjoy, like it says, knowledge is pleasant to thy soul, where it's a nice thing, it's a good thing. Like, oh man, every little bit of knowledge I receive, that's a good thing. And you know, sometimes the way that knowledge is delivered is through the form of a rebuke, through a form of a correction, and when you could get to the point where you say, you know what, I actually like that. I want to hear about all the bad things that I'm doing. What, what am I doing that's wrong, God? Open it up to me. I'm not afraid to, to you know, I'm not gonna, gonna just go sit in a corner and cry about it. I want to change and I want to do what's right. I actually love when I see, hey, I've been doing this wrong. Now I can do it right. When it's pleasant to get that knowledge unto their soul. Then it says in verse 11, discretion shall preserve thee and understanding shall keep thee. So it's gonna, you're going to be preserved in the way that you go. You're going to be made safe. You're going to you know, be able to uh, be kept by God 
through that wisdom, through that understanding, and discretion is, is knowing the, the right path to make. It's, it's being discreet and um, having the discretion to, or discernment to know right from wrong. Verse number 12, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things. So now he's saying the, the wisdom that you gain and the leading of God will help you to identify the evil man and to, to be delivered from them, for one, because the evil man, for one of the things they're doing is they're looking to seek and destroy, right? They're looking to attack and do evil things on other people. So by gaining this wisdom, you're going to be led in the paths that will go around the, the obstacle, go around the, the evil man, go, you know, kind of stay away from them to where they're not going to be able to, um, to do damage unto you. Also, so that they won't be able to, uh, you know, you won't be influenced by them to join them and do evil with them. Now, um, one of the things that, one of the words that's mentioned here is, it's uh, kind of an older word, it's not used very much, it's fro-word. But this is a great chapter for even understanding what that word means. The words used in almost every verse here in the next few verses, fro-word, fro-word, fro-word. So if you don't know what it means, look at it in the context and this, you can do this with most words that you don't understand in the Bible. Read, try to find all the places it's used and just look at it in context. You will get a general understanding of a word even if you don't know the exact definition. So let's, let's, let's take that exercise here just in case maybe you don't know it for a word. Maybe you do know what it means, but it's a good example here. Verse number 12, to deliver from the way of the evil man from the man that speaketh froward things. So right off the bat, it's talking about someone who's an evil man, a bad man, and he's speaking froward things. So right off the bat, I mean, just think about some of the things that a bad man would be saying. That's what froward means. It's froward things, right? But let's keep reading. It says, Who leave the paths of uprightness, so they're not doing the things that they should be doing, and it's not walking in good ways, to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil. They're glad in the evil that they do. And delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked, and they froward in their paths. So, verse 15, their ways and their paths it's the same thing, right? Their way or their path. And it says their ways are crooked and they're froward in their path. So basically the word froward here, you can see it's like crooked. It's basically, uh, froward is, is contrary, is what it means. I mean, the word really is you're kind of contrary to anything that's good. You're being real froward. You're being rebellious against the things that are right. That's what froward is. And you kind of get that understanding just by reading it in context. So don't worry or be too concerned when you run across words that you don't understand. When you have a lot of context like this, even without knowing the exact definition, you can get, okay, yeah, this is talking about someone who has a heart that wants to do bad things. Right? And that's what froward generally means here. And we could gain that from the, uh, from the context. But getting wisdom and getting wisdom from God Look at these people. I mean, this describes a really evil man. These are the types of people that, have a, that most ordinary people have a hard time understanding and even remembering or, or realizing that these people exist. There's a lot of people that have the false assumption that everybody's generally good. This, this notion that, well, we're all pretty good. Just because you may want to do what's right, and you can recognize that you're a sinner, but you don't, you know, the people that I know closer, my friends, even when I was unsaved, I wasn't just like out to do evil to somebody, right? I wasn't just like, hey, let's plan how I can rob this guy over here, you know, and, and, and kill him and take all their stuff. I wasn't plotting anything like that. Now, I was probably like most people in general, your average person but not everybody is like you. Not everybody has that type of thinking where you, know, you would never really want to hurt somebody and, and plan and plot to do that. Because there are plenty of people out there that are wicked people. They're bad people. And we're, we get reminded over and over again that these people exist. This is part of a description here of someone who's evil. It says, that, you know, and getting God's wisdom will deliver you from those people. The wicked man, it says... He speaks forward things. He, le he leaves the path of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. He rejoices to do evil. It's something that he actually likes to do. He enjoys it. 
doing bad things to people and delights in the frowardness of the wicked. It actually is something that, that he enjoys, whose ways are crooked and they're froward in their paths. And this is an example of a reprobate of someone like a Romans 1. The Bible says in Romans 1, the last verse, you know, who not only do these things, but have pleasure in them that do them. You know, they do these things are worthy of death. And not only do they do it themselves, but they have pleasure in other people that do the same thing. I mean, they're so wicked and bitter and, and hate God and love the ways of unrighteousness and they love the filth and, and, and wickedness of this world and doing evil unto people. And they love it so much, they, they even love it when other people do it. That's the wicked. And these people exist. We need to be aware of that and be a constant reminder and get God's wisdom to be able to spot these people, to identify it when they start speaking froward things. Be like, oh, watch out for that guy. I want nothing to do with him. I'm not going to get involved with him in business. I'm not going to get involved with him with any reason. Because that sounds like a froward man. He loves the ways of wickedness. And I'm going to avoid them. And, and you know, when you start getting the wisdom, you can identify it easier. Uh, let's keep reading here. Verse number 16. It also helps you not to be deceived by those people. Because when you can spot the traits and, and start to realize, you know, they're not out for any good for me. Because what they'll try to do is flatter you and butter you up. They're not stupid. They look for, they look for any way to, to get your guard down before they come in and, and do their evil, whatever that may be. Look at verse 16. Let's keep reading here. The Bible says, to deliver thee from the strange woman. So the, first, the last few verses, we're talking about the man, the evil, wicked man. Now we're talking about the strange woman and from even the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. Now when it says there's a strange woman, it's not talking about like some weirdo. right? It's not saying like the oh, strange person over there. She's got like blue, green hair and, you know, weird, just weird looking. That's not what I mean. Strange just means they're a stranger to you, someone you don't know. It's just an unknown person to you. So the strange woman is just, just you know, like I said, somebody, it's not a relative, it's not a friend, it's a strange woman. Or, and, and in this case, and in most cases, it's a strange woman for a man, so if a woman that's not your wife is a strange woman. That's what they're referred to as. So even if it's someone that you know, the strange woman is not yours. It's not your wife. It's someone you should have no business with um, in many senses. So it says here to deliver the, the wisdom that you gain is going to help to deliver you from the strange woman. It says, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Because the adulteress, the one that hunts and seeks the precious life, the one that's actually out to get you as a married man to commit adultery, because they're out there, they do exist, the women that will try to get you just, be, just because of the fact that you're a Christian and you're pure, they're going to want to try to bring you down and get you to, to and it's not that they even care about you. It's like a, a sport. They hunt for the precious life. It's a sport to them. Just like I go out hunting elk, you know. I go out and I try to track them and find them and get a good shot and shoot them and kill them. It's sport for wicked people and wicked women to just to find a righteous man and just to get him to commit adultery. And the way that they do it here, it says they flatter with their words. And we got to watch out for flattery. I preach an entire sermon on flattery where people will just overdo it and just compliment you and compliment. Oh, I'll tell you how great you look and how great you are and how, you know, how wonderful you are. and Just lay it on thick and flatter you with their words. Because guys like to be praised. Guys like to hear those things. But let it be a red flag when you start getting the, the flattery from a strange woman, from someone who's not your wife. You should have no business with that. Amen. You just politely just, just thanks, you know, and don't, don't form a friendship in a relationship with someone that's not your wife, especially when they're, when they're bringing up you know, this flattery and just really praising you so much. Stay away from that. Because we're going to see why here in verse 7, 17. Which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. So here's a woman here that she had some guidance in her youth. Right? Let's look at, look at the strange woman. But she forsook it. She didn't incline her ear unto the wisdom and unto the knowledge. It was available to her, but she forsook it. She didn't want to have anything to do with it. And it says, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. She was told the covenant of her God. She was told the right things to do. She forgot about it. She didn't want anything to do. She, she didn't keep it in her heart. She forgot. When you keep it in your heart, you're not forgetting. 
Verse 18. Look at, it gets even worse about this woman. For her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. That's a pretty serious warning. Saying, look, her household, it leads to death. Like, that's final. Death. You're done. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. So once they go there, he's saying, that's it. This is, this is a serious warning. You need to watch out for that strange woman. Don't be like the, the ox that's being led to the slaughter, guys. Don't be deceived by the, the looks or the, the flattery and just think, oh, wow, this person, you know, and, and just give up your life, your marriage, your family, all for just some sinful, wicked pleasure for a moment. The pleasure of sin for a season or for a night or for whatever. It's not worth it. It'll destroy your life. And you will... And, no matter how deceived, don't be deceived by, by, the, by Satan's, you know, show of what sin is and, and make it seem like it's going to be really great and, and way better than it actually is because I guarantee you, and I've never done it, you don't even have to have done it, I guarantee you it never will be cracked up because what's going to happen is you may think and have this worked up of how great this will be and, and how you know, awesome this person would be to have a relationship with. And it's going to fall apart in an instant and you probably won't even get to enjoy what you thought you were going to enjoy because you, you had this, this image of what the sin was going to be like and it's not going to even be like that at all. It's just fake. Like all sin, it's just fake. And it's empty. And it's going to leave you uh, way worse off than, it, than, than ever. And, and the sin of adultery is, in my opinion, is one of the absolute worst sins that you could commit to anybody in the world. One of the worst. I mean, maybe short of pedophilia or something that's just perverted, bizarre, disgusting like that. But taking the trust of your spouse and just, and just forsaking that and forsaking everything you have for, for one moment of pleasure I mean that the trust and everything else is involved that's why the Bible puts a death penalty on adulterers mm -hmm. just because of how wicked of a sin that is and we live in an adulterous generation we live in a generation where people just they treat marriage as like dating you get to break up with your spouse and just get a new spouse and they don't care about their vows and you find someone else they don't even care about the adultery anymore well everybody's doing it and it's just an attitude of, of acceptance. And you just expect it to happen these days. Well, I don't. And honestly, that's gonna, that is a, a major downfall for the society is when it just turns adulterous because the love of many, that's, that's one of the reasons why love of many is going to wax cold. Because you don't understand what love even is. When you're dedicated to somebody, when you make a vow and it's for, for better and for worse and you could actually stick with a person and you could forsake everybody else but your spouse, but your husband or your wife and just stay with that one person, that's true love. That is, I mean, that, that is something to be exalted. But when you don't have that and you just bounce around and you're just going and committing adultery and, you, you know, the love wax is cold. You don't even know what love is. And people these days have forgotten um, what that's all about. And, but you don't have to go down the path of the world. Gain the wisdom from God's word. Avoid the, the evil man. Avoid the strange woman. Don't lay hold on her paths that lead to the dead. Now, look at how far gone this strange woman is. Now, think about her just as a person, right? That's someone we need to avoid. But the strange woman is somebody's daughter. The strange woman is somebody's sister, some, you know, somebody's relative. All the strange women out there that we're told to avoid, they all started off as a little girl somewhere. If she would have just listened to instruction from her youth, just listen to God's word, listen to the wisdom. We need God's wisdom to avoid being this person and to avoid being deceived by this person. Both. We need the wisdom for both. Girls, listen up. This is important. 
Sit down and listen. God's wisdom in listening to the Bible and listening to these words in Proverbs will keep you from being a woman here that is described as someone whose ways lead unto death and destruction and that we need to avoid. Let's finish up the chapter here. Look at verse number 20. That thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of, right, of the righteous for the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. Very simple. The good ways lead to, to prosperity and, and long life and, you know, and, and just a good existence. The bad ways lead to death and destruction. You know, it's very basic and rudimentary and simple. And he's saying, you know, you're going to be cut off. The wicked's going to be cut off. They're going to be, um, they're not going to get any of the things that they think they're getting through their wickedness. They lay the, the, the traps for themselves. But if you can just do what's right, God will preserve you, God will protect you, and keep you uh, in your path. So let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these words of wisdom. God, I know that some of this might seem repetitive, dear Lord, but help us not to be bored with it. Help us not to um, forsake the instruction that you provide for us, dear Lord, but that we would embrace it and love it and seek after it and just daily, dear Lord, try to learn from your words and increase our wisdom and increase our knowledge, dear Lord. Help us never to be deceived by the evil man or the strange woman, dear Lord, that are just out to destroy. Help us to just constantly remember that these people exist and that we would keep ourselves far from them and far from their reach, dear Lord, that we can just... Um, Continue to incline our ears unto your knowledge and not be deceived. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.